Hey guys, welcome to the WWE Podcast for this official Survivor Series 2020 preview and prediction show. And tonight, we've got someone completely new that you've never heard from before. Her name is Mimi. She's a longtime listener and brand new part of the WWE Podcast team to join me for nearly two hours of the Survivor Series preview and prediction. Of course, we also talk about SmackDown and the current product, how she got into wrestling and uh, introducing you guys to her at the top of the show. And she'll also be starting her own show starting next week with the highs and lows of WWE. So we're looking forward to that, and I think you guys will be as well. So without further ado, let's get everything started right now. Welcome to the WWE Podcast. The most passionate and authentic wrestling analysis on the web. We've got you covered with every Raw, SmackDown, and NXT show. Giving you a no bullshit opinion. We know you love wrestling. We do too. So let's get this show underway. And that's the bottom line. What? Because Stone Cold sits Hey guys, welcome to the WWE Podcast. We've got a massive show for you tonight with Mimi Burris, who is joining us tonight to talk about WWE Survivor Series 2020 and preview predictions. And yes, we talk about SmackDown a, a, a bit at the beginning of the show and a little bit on her personal journey as a wrestling fan, which is a blast. And she's which is a pleasure to talk to. Two hours nearly of discussing wrestling with her, which is felt like 20 minutes so uh, i think she's going to do great things here i hope you guys will support her and her new show that will be exclusive here on the wwe podcast starting next sunday uh we will be doing or she will be doing a highs and lows of the week i like that you know it's like one of those like how did i not think of that right so uh certainly smart and uh well spoken and i'm really looking forward to having her as part of the team here uh and uh let me know what you guys think because having a female voice too doesn't hurt, right? Like it's all seems to be all guys. It's a very male dominated podcast industry with wrestling, especially. So uh, very very cool to hear her, uh, if you're a wrestling fan's perspective, being being a woman, right? And does the same thing interest her? Does the same thing for the women's division? Does she view it the same way I do? I mean, it's 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 great. So I hope you'll uh, help me join her and welcoming her to uh, the WWE podcast team. So, alrighty, well we've got a again a big show. As I said, and a bit of an announcement, many of you have responded to me and said that you'd like a live show. So here's what I'm going to do. Okay, we'll still keep the voicemails. That voicemail number is not going to change. That voicemail number will remain the same, and I will still do voicemail shows. So there's that. However, when there is something big going on, like a pay-per-view, or a massive news story breaks, I want to be able to hear you guys. I want to be able to hear your voices. I want to be able to respond in real time. No safety net. You should hear all the edits I do. I mean, sometimes I, I just ramble on or I say things I shouldn't. So it's going to be fun to hear me with no net. Uh, and here's what we're going to do. Blog Talk Radio. I still have an account there. I reactivated that account. Uh, and I expect everyone to donate $5. I'm joking. Um, so I have that account. I did reactivate. And it is a live format. If you haven't followed me before, you don't know what I'm talking about, blogtalkradio.com. Search out the WWE podcast, and you'll see my logo there, and you can call in. Now, here's the call-in number for the live show, not for voicemail. Voicemail is going to remain the same. But for the live show, which I will be starting tomorrow night following the pay-per-view, it starts at 1030, so hopefully, (laughs) I'm kind of banking on it. I scheduled it and locked it in. Hopefully, by 1030, Survivor Series will be done. These pay-per-views seem to be getting a little bit shorter, and some have ended around 10. I'm banking at 10.30. Uh, 10.30 tomorrow night, I'll be going live to take your calls. So that number is 516-387-1528. That's 516-387-1528. So call in. And you'll have to press one on your phone. It'll prompt you. Or maybe it won't. I I can't honestly remember. If you press one, you'll get into the caller queue. Okay. So hopefully we get some callers. If we don't, okay, no problem. I mean, like I'll keep this for like a month or two to see how it works. Maybe it's worth it. Maybe it's not. Uh, But uh, I want to let you know I did listen. And I've got Blog Talk Radio back. And you can call in using that number. So uh, 
That will be immediately following the pay-per-view, which I hope is around 1030. And then following that, the botch guy will be joining me and we will be doing a full Survivor Series review. So that is going to be coming your way by early Monday morning. You'll see the botch guy and myself cover the entire pay-per-view. So that'll be a blast. We usually run about an hour on uh, on pay-per-view night. So uh, a lot of, lot of podcasting for me tomorrow night. A lot of fun for you, I hope. But that's what's going to happen. Podcast or uh, live shows will remain or be re, uh, restarted. And the voicemails will remain intact. So how about that? Best of both worlds. So uh, again, 516-387-1528. And go to blogtalkradio.com and search out the WWE podcast. You'll see the show created for tomorrow night. And uh, I'll also be putting out a link on my Twitter feed, which is wrestling underscore audio and on uh, Instagram at wrestling or WWE underscore podcast. So I'll be trying to get it out as much as possible. But if you just search it out on blog talk radio, you should find it. And by the way, go follow the botch guy on YouTube. If you haven't, what are you doing? Right? If you're a wrestling fan, you love YouTube videos of wrestling, head on over to YouTube and search out the botch guy. Him and I, again, will be doing a live show tomorrow night, at least in our live format not on the blog talk radio format but recording live tomorrow night for your monday night and monday morning review of survivor series so head on over to youtube though super fun to watch his videos posts almost daily about wrestling quick watch you know you don't have to commit 30 minutes to it it's usually like two three minutes tops and just a very very magnetic personality you'll you'll see what i mean when you go there so if you haven't you do yourself a favor head on over to youtube search out the botch guy and hit that subscribe button so already Let's get to Survivor Series with Mimi and myself getting into, again, SmackDown at the beginning, but all Survivor Series towards the back end with our predictions that uh, we don't agree on everything, which is great. So you'll have to hear that. And uh, again, tomorrow night, guys, I'll be back. I'll be live following the show. Head on over to Block Talk Radio. Find out. Find the WWE podcast, follow us, and uh, you'll be able to get in to the caller queue, and we can discuss Survivor Series, and I have a feeling it's going to be a lot to discuss. Good, bad, and indifferent. So, all righty, guys, you know the deal. I'll talk to you next time. All right, everybody, welcome to the WWE podcast, and uh, we have a special show tonight, not just because it's the Survivor Series preview and prediction show, but also we've got someone new that you guys have never heard from before. But I think you will be glad that you did, and you will continue to to, uh, to listen to this individual. Her name is Mimi Burris, and she is a longtime listener to the show. We're going to be having her join the team here, not just for tonight, but also for the coming weeks, where she will be doing a weekly uh, highs and lows for that week in WWE. So, uh, Mimi, welcome to the show. It's really, really exciting to have you here, especially have a female voice on the show. I think that also is is definitely a plus. So how you doing? Hi, yeah, I'm good, thanks. Um, I'm excited. Uh, I, w- I was thinking about, um, oh, I'm grateful um, that, that we got this to work out, and I was thinking about just, you know, I, I thought about, you know, emailing you and asking you about that idea for a little while, just because, you know, we were talking about before, I, you know, I've been a closet wrestling fan for a long time, like just, uh, and there are not a lot of people, you know, in my life that I can talk about wrestling with. Um, and so, you know, to get a, get a chance to like therapeutically just air out some frustrations, right. And, and some stuff that I really liked in the product right now, um, is a great opportunity. Yeah. You know, that's what I always say. I mean, if you've listened to me, you know, it's just, it is therapeutic. There are so many fans out there that we listen. We have maybe the one friend that kind of likes wrestling or generally follows it, but they don't. They're not as passionate as you and I are or our listeners because they aren't listening to wrestling podcasts. They just kind of maybe watch Raw or SmackDown here and there, but then then they show for the pay per views. So this is exactly that. It's a therapy session. It's kind of like people are metaphorically sitting on my couch, right? Like I am. I am your therapist, and and we are all together on this one big couch talking about wrestling. And uh, so I- exactly, exactly right. So uh, I-, I guess in, in a way to kind of get our listeners to know you a little bit, how did you come into wrestling? What What are your first memories of wrestling? Yeah, so, I mean, it's all it's all very blurry, I think, because like I, I started wrestling or watching wrestling when I was young, young, like that kind of mem- that young, young enough where you can't remember most of the stuff, just little pictures from here and there. But what I can tell you is I remember John Cena. 
So I would say like the best way to encompass it is John Cena was probably my Hulk Hogan, if that makes any sense. And, um, and oh yeah, a lot of John Cena and being young and being a young girl who loved John Cena and then growing up a little bit and understanding a little bit more. And then, you know, uh, finding people like there was CM Punk, you know, but I'm talking about like long hair CM Punk, like ECW CM Punk and, um, what, that terrible rendition of WWE's ECW CM Punk, like those kind of pictures coming to my mind, original Miz and Morrison, you know, with the fedora hat and those terrible shorts. Uh, we're talking like, you know, Jamaican Kofi Kingston, Rey Mysterio was my favorite when I was young for a while, Randy Orton. Um, so that's probably about kind of the, the main time I started watching. I know that's probably a little all over the place, but those are all the memories that come to mind. And then, you know, being able to go back and watch things, I used to spend my time like just on YouTube, such like a dork looking up, you know, I loved watching anything evolution for the longest time. I just thought Triple H and Randy Orton, Batista and Ric Flair, I thought that was so well done. And so I would just kind of like, you know, hop back and forth from all these random evolution segments and matches. And so, so that's kind of, I guess how I got into it. I don't remember what the first thing I ever watched was. I couldn't tell you what, you know, what match drew me into wrestling and said, Oh, I got to have more of this. It was just kind of, uh, that was like, I think the, the ruthless aggression era was kind of like my, your version of your attitude era. That's exactly what it is. And that's not a bad era to come up in. I know people look at the attitude era as the gold standard of wrestling. And yes, it had an absolute all-star legend roster on it. And it was a TV 14. It was a different time and place. And uh, But at the same time, the Ruthless Aggression era, even the tail end and the beginning of the PG era, which is when you came in, it still had some big names in there. Like you said, I mean, it was headlined by John Cena. You had Randy Orton. Of course, you know, I, I know you did see Evolution, one of the biggest groups of all time. It's really a, not a, a bad time at all to be com- coming into wrestling. And uh, certainly, you, I mean, you look at today's product, you fast forward, my gosh, 15 years later. And you still see some of those same people here, right? Like Randy Orton, still here, still looks like he hasn't aged a day. I mean, so uh, it, it is, it's a much different product now, but you came in at a really good time, I think. And uh, so, yes, John Cena is your Hulk Hogan, right? Like that's exactly what he is. And he kind of was that wholesome, pretty much say your prayers and eat your vitamins type of character. I mean, he was kind of that... Uh, he, he really was, which I think turned a lot of the, quote, hardcore fans, which is how they labeled me, uh, being uh, growing up in the Attitude Era, seeing Stone Cold drink beer, flip people off to the John Cena kind of soft uh, version of what Austin and Rock were, which is why I think a lot of the, the men rejected him and continue to reject John Cena, and why they rejected Roman Reigns, I think, for so long as well, kind of the heir apparent to John Cena being that soft kind of PG corporately created baby face. Uh, although not now Roman Reigns, I think is doing the best work of his career period. Uh, so, all right. So what are your favorite match? Do you have a favorite match matches? I know that it's kind of a tough thing to ask because there are probably over 15 years or wherever, however long you've been watching. Certainly you have a lot of memories. You have a lot of different things that you remember that you love and you're looking up on YouTube as I am, but do you have a favorite match and or matches or moments? I should say, as WWE would like to say. <laughs> yeah. I, it's so funny. It's such a tough question to, to answer to. And I, and I hate to give like the, the stereotypical answer of the, you know, the first HBK undertaker match at WrestleMania, but I also, it's like to go beyond that, you know, I would say we, you know, remember when they had the, you'd have to, you'd have to order the DVDs to watch these pay-per-views. Um, and, uh, and so I remember we had the WrestleMania and I couldn't tell you the number, but the one, um, with big show and Floyd Mayweather, uh, we had that like DVD set and we had those TVs in the back seats of your car. Um, and so we would, you know, when we go on a road trip or something, we'd watch that in the back seat. Uh, and you know, that was probably one of my favorite pay-per-views. I don't know if it's just nostalgia, um, or, you know, actual good matches because I'm, I'm blanking on any other match on that card right now but um i do remember loving loving watching that and then i guess uh you know i got again a dvd i remember for christmas one year my brother got me a um ray mysterio dvd it was like a three-part dvd and it had all you know ray mysterio was like walking on a beach and then he would introduce you to one match and then you go to the next one or whatever 
And to be able to go back and watch his matches with Eddie Guerrero and, you mm-hmm. know, I, I don't, I, I couldn't even form words when that, you know, that was going on. Some of those matches, I think, are probably one of my favorite matches of all time. And it seems like a cheap answer because, like I said, I, I never was able to watch something like that live. But I just remember loving, you know, being a kid and loving, you know, Rey Mysterio was like a superhero. Nobody could just like, you know, hop. There wasn't all these like flips and dives and stuff like there is today. Like he was one of the few who could actually really do it well. So, yes, I mean, the, the flips and dives, I mean, you know how I feel about all that stuff, Dave. But to answer your, your question, I mean, that was WrestleMania 24. Four. I, I was going to cut in, but I wasn't 100% sure. I wasn't sure if it was 23, 24, but I did Google it just so everyone knows. Uh, it was 24, and uh, yeah, the Floyd Money Mayweather and Big Show match, not to review it, but I think that match absolutely out, outperformed what a lot of people may have feared would have been a total disaster of a match. Uh, I love that build. I do remember that very well. Edge and Undertaker, I believed, headlined that for the World Heavyweight yeah, Championship, uh, and I believe Undertaker captured it that year, so... Um, yes, mm-hmm. I do remember that on a, on a very foggy spring break in Panama City when I was 20, oh gosh, uh, 20, mid-20s. Uh, it, was, it was a very foggy time for me. But yeah, I mean, I remember that very well. And uh, so your memories, while you say, I mean, it is, I agree. It's hard to pick one match, hard to pick one moment. But it, it's really a collection of moments that you have that kind of bring you into wrestling. And while it is a tough or, or it's a difficult thing to come across in today's product to have those moments when you do have those moments of like, Oh my God. And you get drawn in and you get chills. You're like, this is why I love wrestling. I, I mean, this is, this is why I am just forever a fan. And the latest for me was probably last year's Royal rumble with edges return. Um, but, uh, did you have, or recently have had one of those like, Oh man, this is why I love wrestling. Have you had one of those moments recently? Yeah, this is such a stupid answer, but I feel funny. I, I we like I, so I'm a nanny um, now, and uh, and a, and like a glorified house cleaner. So essentially, for the beginning of half of my day, I'm alone, and I get to clean and take care of some animals and whatever. And so I can listen to you know podcasts or um, or I'll put on like just random pay per views, and I'll go through maybe like five, six, seven, you know, in a random year, and then I pick another random year, and I just kind of like follow the story from then, and um. And I watched, uh, and again, I'm going to blank on the, the pay-per-view, but it was only a couple of years ago, and it was um, an Alexa Bliss match versus Naomi. And it was right before WrestleMania, so it must have been Elimination Chamber or something. And um, and I think it was, two, maybe it was 2017. Um, there was a brand split, like a, a real brand split. And um, and Naomi, it wasn't, a go- it, was, it wasn't a great match. It was a botched finish. You know, she messed up. But, like, uh, afterwards, you know, there was the first time she won the title, and the crowd's chanting, you deserve it. And it's like this heartfelt moment. And I'm like, I'm not, I don't cry. I'd like the dog commercial, you know, with the, like the Pepsi dog commercial with the horse or whatever that commercial is. Like, I'm just not like one of those people who gets emotional about that kind of stuff or movies or anything. But like that moment had me welling up for some reason. And so it's like those random, like you said, those random times when like, I don't know, it just hits something in you or hits home and you're like, oh, this is why I watch. Like, you know, this match, again, the match wasn't great, but the story of this person who tried, you know, was worked really hard. You watched her in the Funkadactyls, what a mess that was. And, uh, and to be able to see, and like, you know, it all culminates to that moment. It was cool. And so what a weird thing to pick, but I just remember watching that and being like, oh, yeah, that's like, again, brought me, like my eyes got watery. Mm-hmm. That's, this is exactly why we watch wrestling, right? Like, and it's, it's the same reason we, we all watch TV shows or movies that, draw emotion we're human beings we are emotional by nature and we don't and when we don't have emotion it's hard to get attached it's just very superficial which is why i'm not a big fan of putting so much emphasis on athleticism and so little emphasis on story because story is what draws out emotion not necessarily the superficial moves in the ring those are just vehicles to tell the story but if you don't have something underneath it it's just kind of meaningless. So, uh, yeah, I, I totally get that. I mean, I totally get those moments that just kind of happen. So uh, I guess because I haven't asked you yet, how have you been faring in this COVID era with no fans, given that the belief is, and I think it's accurate, that the biggest superstar ever are the fans? Because without the fans, it is, I don't want to say it's soulless, but at first, it kind of felt that way with an empty uh, performance center, now known as the Capital City Wrestling Center, I believe. Uh, it, it felt very 
lost. It felt directionless or, or soulless. I, I, you know, it kind of is. I mean, it is what it is. And now they have the Thunderdome. They're, I guess, going to Tropicana Field in a couple of weeks, three, four weeks, to go into that arena for the Thunderdome and eventually maybe bring fans back is what I'm hearing. So uh, how have you been watching wrestling? Has been has it been harder for you to watch without the fans physically there? Yeah, it's miserable. <laughs> I was just again, we were just talking about this today. I um I've we've done we've fared fairly well in the whole, you know, in this pandemic with our with our personal lives, but so it's like talk about a privileged thing to be able to say probably the biggest hit in my life in this pandemic is the fact that my favorite thing to watch, you know, like you said, the soul's been taken out of it. Um and I appreciate everything they've done, you know, whether it's been like the creativity of of just taking the train like the NXT trainees and having them as fans and the Thunderdome and all this stuff. I, I, I appreciate it. Like the, the pumped in audio and stuff like that. It makes it a little more bearable, but, um, but what was I just watching again? I go back and watch a lot of just random pay-per-views and I just watched the 2015 Royal Rumble one where um, in Philadelphia, where Roman Reigns uh, wins and, and to hear again, just to hear the, even if it was cheering, but just to hear the absolute like unity of this entire arena, you know, booing this guy, it reminded me or whatever, like, oh my gosh, I miss that. Like, I miss that genuine reaction like that, you know, WWE can't tell me who I'm cheering for or who I'm not, you know, these people like voicing their opinions on the spot, not on Twitter. I don't, I'm not on Twitter too, but like, you know, it's, it's, it's just lost without it, you know, in my opinion. So I'm, I'm itching for when, you know, they can bring fans back in. Obviously I want everybody to be safe and that's the first priority. Like, you know, my viewing pleasure falls behind that, but, um, but I miss it. I miss it a lot. It is tough and we've adjusted as fans. I think, I mean, at first we were all not just in our personal lives, just totally disheveled, but in our entertainment lives, it became it became difficult to watch, especially when they were constantly shooting at empty, empty chairs. And you could hear actually like, like the announcers, not only on their headsets, but it was pick, being picked up by the cameramen. So it was kind of like, it was doubling down on, you know, and, and a constant reminder of how empty things are. And again, I'm with you. I'm appreciative of everything they've done. They could have shut it down. Vince could have shut it down and, and said, you know, look, we'll, we'll be back when this thing's over. Uh, but knowing Vince McMahon, like you and I do, and most of the fans do, there was nothing that's going to stop Vince. He's of the mindset that the show must go on. I mean, they are always of that mindset, and I appreciate that. And, and it's drawn not not always positive feedback because there's a lot of people who felt it was insensitive for him to continue, that it was unsafe for the performers to be there. Uh, and I think while there have been a couple of outbreaks – and as expected, there haven't been any massive casualties or any casualties that I know of that uh, have resulted in, or, uh, because of them continuing operations. And I think if people appreciate it because people need an escape. And I think that's what they think, too, is that they need they the fans need them more than ever. And I'm with you, though, that reaction, that instant feedback, I miss so much. And I yes, I agree. Pumped in audio. Fine. Like they they are doing what they can. I wish that it was real we all wish it was real and they have the fans there on the led boards and that's fine but and that is the best that they can do right now but like you said that example and i bring up that 2015 world rumble a lot because it it, it points to the time that i thought they should have turned roman heel period and just left it there but uh yeah even the rock couldn't save roman that night i mean the rock a returning Ro uh, rock could not save roman they were booing everybody uh, that I will never forget. So thank you, Philadelphia. That was beautiful. But, uh, yeah, that is what I miss. It's that instant reaction, that connection that you feel at home with the people that are in that arena. And yes, there is Twitter, there's Instagram, there's Snapchat. I mean, there's a million social media applications, but it's, it's not the same. So yes, the soul needs to come back. I don't know when it's coming back. Uh, do you have any, what, what's your guess, right? Like, what do you think will happen? With WWE, do you think they'll slowly try to roll the dice and bring people back? Or do you think they'll still kind of hold back and wait for this thing to, quote, be over if there's ever such a thing? I think they will definitely be the first, quote unquote, sport that brings fans back in an arena. I think, you know, before basketball, hockey, football, anything else, I think they will probably be the first, you know, 
again use that term <clears throat> use that term lightly sport that brings a that brings fans back in the arena but i don't know i'm i'm kind of i'm at the uh the view of trying to be not pessimistic about this but just taking uh, i'd rather be pleasantly surprised than disappointed again and you know having someone say oh this is all going to be over next month and here we are you know seven months later or whatever so um i, I don't know I'm, I'm hoping at least by the royal rumble there's some um there's some organic fan response, whatever that looks like, you know, like vocal response, because that, you know, again, to talk about a pay-per-view that, that, that feeds off, you know, that, that countdown and the reaction from the fans. So, um, so I don't know when, but my hope is by January, but I, I have a, I, I doubt that's going to happen. I know. So and I'm, I, I'm with you. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I, I'm just, um, I, I keep doing landmarks in my mind of, Okay, well, maybe by SummerSlam, right? Like, they're going to try. they got to have fans try to be there by SummerSlam. And now we're at, oh, well, Survivor Series. It's kind of like this, the beginning of the road to the Rumble, which is the road to the uh, to road to WrestleMania. they got to have people at Survivor Series. Now we're looking at the Royal Rumble, and we're like, oh, well, how do the how people are not going to be there? That's just going to be so weird. How do they have countdowns? I mean, they'll pump in the audio, of course, but it's just not the same. You know, and then how do they do WrestleMania? That they can't not do it again this year. So we, I, at least that's my the way my mind is working. Is like they got to do this, right? Like how? But it, I don't think it's WWE driving this. Certainly not. It's the Florida Health Department. It's the overall perception of the organization. I'm sure if they just went full bore, people would. I mean, I don't even know if honestly they'd pack the arena because I'm sure fans would actually still be hesitant. But I don't know if they're concerned about a PR pushback of wait a minute what this is so irresponsible of wwe and you know I, they're very sensitive of that and, and rightfully so but yeah the, like i think the bottom line is we all miss fans i know that the i'm sure the wrestlers miss us as well because they are born for that reaction they're, they're created from that reaction they live for that reaction they are their whole character is built around crowd reaction and when they don't have it and we can't be there to supply it, it's just it's really hard. And I'm sure we're all we're all in the same boat. I mean, I, I, I could say that pretty confidently. But as we get into Survivor Series, I mean, we have a lot to talk about. We're going to get into the specifics of the matches and your thoughts on what could happen and my thoughts as well. But we, before we do, SmackDown happened. SmackDown happened last night. And what did you take away from that? What are some of the some of the key items that you maybe wanted to chat about before we get into Survivor Series? Um, yeah, I don't know where to start, right? Um, I think, I think the, not to start on a, on a low note, but um, the first thing that comes to mind is, I guess, that, you know, we're talking about the, the five-on-five elimination match, the men's elimination match, and, and I was of, uh, which I think many other people were too, from what I gathered, were, you know, of the presumption that, that Big E was going to be the last um, man on the team. You know, they'd have some qualifying match and we'd watch it figuring Big E was going to win. And um, and then they just appointed Otis as, uh, you know, Adam Pierce just said, Otis, uh, you know, I admire your story or whatever, you know, whatever he was saying, I admire your story and your, your dedication or I don't know, whatever, whatever he was saying and, and you know, put him on the team. And, and I, I don't know if I was disappointed. I guess my, my thoughts were like, you know, if, uh, if SmackDown's going to take the loss at the pay-per-view, then I'm okay with, you know, with Otis being on the team because I don't, I don't think I want Big E to take a loss like that. But, uh, but I, I just, I was confused. I guess everybody else seemed to have to qualify. Seth Rollins had to qualify and Otis is just appointed on the team. That is something that I am glad you brought that up because if in and, and WWE has gotten lucky many times over the last seven, eight months, however long the pandemic's been going on now, for things that they did on TV that fans weren't able to the, able to be there to tell them, no, 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 this is a terrible idea. And they're able to just kind of play while the parents are away, for lack of a better analogy. And that's exactly what's happening here with Otis. I think they've heard fans loud and clear that him being the Money in the Bank briefcase holder was a bad idea given the presentation of of his character, which I could I could go on for many, many hours about how terribly they have managed Otis. Um, but you're right. I think this is a bad choice by WWE, not just because Otis doesn't deserve it. I mean, he's been on a losing streak for a, a while. I mean, he hasn't exactly been at the forefront of any championship opportunities, and he has been really just relegated to kind of a comedy side act. I mean, he's been 
just this guy who wears shirt, you know, tight shirts that he shouldn't, and he likes to eat food, and he says, oh, yeah. I mean, he just, that's what he does. I mean, he's, we're all supposed to laugh. But if there were fans in an arena here, I think, and they were able to react genuinely, they would have booed Otis here. I mean, I think they would have booed that choice, given that people wanted Big E. I wanted Big E. Why he's not in this, I don't know. Why Big E continues to hang on to his New Day character, I don't know. Uh, he's, it's just hanging on to something he's not a part of anymore. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I don't understand it. I don't know what Otis did to deserve it, which is nothing. Um, but we are here, and I, I don't I don't know. Is, is there any positive that could come out of this, of Otis instead of Big E? Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing that I can think of is um, is – Two people, right? Chad Gable and Otis, who were who were organically liked by fans before, you know, the the terrible Shorty G thing happened, and and Otis, you know, got, was out of heavy machinery and and whatever whatever all that shenanigans was with, with you know both characters. I think um, I think two guys, right? Chad Gable and Otis, who were like I said, organically liked by fans. I think I think it's going to be really hard for WWE to to present something that isn't going to get over with these two guys. Cause, um, cause like I said, you know, people seem to gravitate towards both of them, um, you know, before, before they were meddled with. And, um, and so I think again, like whatever, I think it seems like he's doing some kind of coaching thing. So whatever this gimmick is, I think it's going to be really hard for WWE to screw this one up. Yeah, it probably, it will be. I, I just don't know why big E and his evolution of character has not happened yet and not even like a little bit you know when he was away or new day was away and injured on smackdown and he was kind of on his own and it was like oh here we go finally we're getting a singles run from big e and we started to see some moments of hope where he was starting to kind of evolve as a character and not just be this over-the-top cartoon character who's concerned more about i don't know throwing pancakes and things and then we got the new day come back and he's back to being the the just the biggie character from new day that's the kind of the spin-off or what's the remnants of new day on smackdown and i was hoping when that happened hey at least let's see some progress every week let's see if biggie is able to show signs small signs of hope that he could change and that he's evolving and we haven't seen that yet and i i i, I don't know um uh, I'm not a fan of the way that they have portrayed Big E so far. I know it's many people find it entertaining and that they enjoy the over-the-top cartoonish type of gyrating and everything else that he does. But if he's going to have a, singles, a successful singles career, something has to change. And I, I just I don't know when they're going to do this. Even Co, uh, Corey Graves on air said that he, if he wants to have a single, successful singles career, he needs to get serious. And so it's it's acknowledged. I'm sure they're hearing it. I just don't know what they're waiting for. Even if Big E took a loss at Survivor Series, he could have had a good showing by eliminating you know two, maybe even three guys on the Raw team. Like they could have done something that made an impact, even in a loss. Yeah, yeah, I was surprised by that. I was thinking like I thought Vince would love to see you know Big E and Keith Lee in the ring together or. Um, any any of that, right? Because it's mostly those four four big men, you know, in the ring against Big E. I think I thought that would have been something that Vince McMahon would have just been salivating over. But um, but I guess Otis is a is a is a second to that. But yeah, no, I was thinking the same thing. I mean, I think I think the big change is going to be when the music changes. And I know it seems like a small thing, but I mean, even if it's like a remix of of his, you know, New Day music, so it's it's almost like just a baby step. But I think once the music changes. He's got a little bit more of an identity for Big E. I think so, too. And and speaking of, and I guess I'm transitioning kind of hardly here, but as far as Alexa Bliss goes on Raw, she had a music change. It came after her character change. Uh, but Alexa Bliss, which I didn't even talk about on my Raw review, had her music change to like this darker, just bass heavy type of uh, cynical version of her, her music. I loved it. So... My question, how do you like Alexa Bliss joining Bray Wyatt and The Fiend in this, this new duo? Oh, I love it. I think it's so good. I um, On Raw, that bump that she took with John Morrison over the barricade, I thought was hilarious, but also awesome. And, and the way she came up with that smile 
and uh, and she like tightrope walked the barricade over to Bray Wyatt. I think I think she's getting a lot of like you know flack for her acting. I think she's doing a great job. I mean, I don't think um, I mean these these people are wrestlers, right? They're not. I wouldn't call them actors. And I think she's doing a great job for where she's at. Um, I think it's completely breathed new life into the whole Bray Wyatt, the theme character. Um, I don't know where they're going with it. I'd like to see, you know, uh, I'd like to see more of her, less of her as a sidekick, if that makes any sense. Like, I think she could be a candidate for the Women's Championship. God knows the Raw Women's Championship needs a little highlighting. Um, and I think, uh, I think first, though, I want to see a match against Nikki Cross. I think, you know, let's flesh the Alexa Bliss character out not just um, as like the fiend sidekick, but like her own, you know, creepy, maniacal self. Yes, it needs to happen. Nikki Cross needs to just, I mean, I'm not going to say she needs to go away, but this, this program needs to happen. So exactly what you said, she can shed the skin of her former self. And it almost feels like that Nikki or uh, yeah, Nikki Cross is the heel in this. And, and, And that's weird to say, given that she logically, has a right to wonder what's going on and try to help a friend. But you're so intrigued by what's going on with Alexa and Bray that you're kind of siding with Alexa to beat her up. And it's not it's not that it's designed that way, but it's kind of like they're tapping into a part of me and maybe you and other fans that it's like, well, yeah, Nikki's kind of right, but I'm this is also what Alexa's doing, and I want to see her beat Nikki up. Like, I love this. It, it's weird. Are you feeling the same way? Yeah, yeah, I think I think if there are fans in the arena, she would definitely be getting cheered right now. Um, but at the same time, I have to say they're 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 not doing a terrible job of making me feel sympathetic for Nikki Cross. You know, um, I think uh, I think it's just like you said, Alexa Bliss is doing such a great job, and she's so intriguing. Like I don't want to call her like the cool heel, but she's um, but you know, fans appreciate good work. Um, whether it's uh, you know in the ring or not, and um, and I think that's exactly what she's doing. So I agree. I think I, I think I don't want to call them a tweener, but it's almost like it's almost like they're they're both the fiend and Alexa Bliss are almost beyond being in a category of a baby face or a heel. Yeah, and I'm I traditionally am not a uh, gray area exists all the time type of deal, especially for a specific character. Usually, I like them to be in one category or the other traditionally that makes sense and has been successful for many, many, many years in all forms of entertainment, having good versus evil. I mean, it still works today. It's not something that is going to ever, uh, you know, expire, so to speak. It it is something that traditionally works. However, with The Fiend, he is exactly that. They haven't ever really positioned him hardcore in one category. He's just kind of been what he is. He's not good or bad yes he's an evil character that apparently is brainwashing people and able to hypnotize people and able to possess people but at the same time you're rooting for this character because it's so original so cool that yeah they're beating up somebody i like but damn it's kind of awesome seeing them do this this is just this is entertaining right so it is exactly that i think wwe has recognized that and the fiend has never really gotten booed Outside of last year's Hell in a Cell with Seth Rollins, that was just a just complete dumpster fire with the finish. Outside of that, I don't really see or hear when we had fans, if we can all remember back that far, when fans were in an arena, I don't remember The Fiend ever getting booed, to my knowledge, outside of that one incident. So this is this is a great place, not just for Alexa, but I think The Fiend as well, because The Fiend... I think needed something additional, even though he was doing good on his own, good to great. He started to feel a little stale and the Bray Wyatt character needed something. And I think as great as this has been for Alexa, I think conversely, it's also been as good for Bray Wyatt and the fiend to kind of feel fresh again. Yeah, I I completely agree. I I think, um, I think you mentioned it before, just, it's kind of a character that is, is better in, in little doses. You know, I don't, I, I want to be excited when I see him on my screen. I don't want to see him every week. Um, and so I guess with that, my rough transition here um, into the undertaker of survivor series, um, you know, with Randy Orton coming out and Alexa bliss was the one to greet him. Uh, I think a couple weeks ago on raw and, you know, it's just kind of been a theme. Do you see, I know you've been talking about, you think The Fiend is going to interrupt The Undertaker. Do you think uh, Alexa Bliss could be the one to come out? Or um, or I guess if you were, if you're in your dream booking situation, how would you book this at Survivor Series? 
so, oh man, I, I've been really mulling this over because there have there's so much that could happen, but at the same time, there's so much that could not happen, and it's just a very straightforward 30 is the Undertaker. Thanks, man. Have a good day. Everyone's coming out to make their tributes and have a good night. Like it very well could be that, and no shenanigans, and it's boring. Like it's a kind of a boring send off. Um, but if I'm WWE and I'm Mark Calloway, I would be thinking, hey, it's November, late November now. We have to just get to Mania, which is five-ish months away, and let's think of something to just do one more time. Let's. This is going to be it. We'll, we'll close it out at Mania and call it a day, win, lose, or draw, fans in the arena or not. And I don't know how they're, they – if they don't take advantage of this, I don't know why they wouldn't. I've always said that WWE and Mark Calloway, who's always willing to give back to the business – why would they not want to promote the hell out of The Undertaker's final match all over social media, pump it out in the news outlets, and squeeze every last viewer and dollar out of their audience as they can? They're a for-profit company. Why wouldn't they want to do that? So I'm still of the belief they're going to do this, and if they don't, I'll kind of be disappointed if it's just a generic, okay, send off, and he does his pose in the ring, and the, the show ends. I'll, I, I, I will be kind of disappointed. Because we're so close to Mania, why not make it happen? So here's what I'm going to propose. Here's what I would propose if I was Vince and uh, Mark and all the creative staff. Everyone comes out. They do their tributes. They come out and they talk at the Taker. And he's kind of like the hybrid of the dead man, Mark Calloway, and uh, Big Evil, uh, American Badass. He's kind of like all three, which is what I think the version we'll see from Mania this year with the Boneyard match. I think it's going to be that same kind of guy. And... They'll all come out and they'll they'll throughout the night maybe they'll tell stories and do video packages of different moments and things, and then at the end of the night, Taker comes out, he does his pose, maybe he gets interrupted, but it's just to say thank you, and you think that things are over, and then you hear the Fiend's music, you hear that like all the lights come down, and Alexa Bliss shows up as you said, and she just looks at Taker, comes out and looks in his eyes and said. He's here, kind of like Poltergeist, like that whole rip off of line from Poltergeist and just looks at him and the fiend appears behind him, hits the mandible claw and very safe bump, obviously, because there really is no bump that's needed from mandible claw takers left in the middle of the ring. The fiend standing over him with the announcers in shock silence to end the show where it's just, there's not even any words needed. The fiend is just standing over taker looking down as the show goes off the air. Like that's how I would book it. I love that. I can hear Michael Cole's. Oh my God. in the back of my head. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I I would probably do the exact same thing or or similar. I mean, my only fear is though, if they do this right. And, and for some reason, or, you know, if, if we're not able to have fans in the arena by WrestleMania is, is that this is a cinematic match. Mm-hmm. But I guess the one caveat I could say to that is, is I could see, like you said, him coming out kind of more in a in a big evil bad badass Undertaker, um, you know, character. But then, right, we have that theme of the the fiend changes people, and so you know, my thought or whatever is, if he's going to come back at WrestleMania, come back as like the Dead Man, the Undertaker, like the the guy who who came out when they uh, when they inducted Paul Bear into the Hall of Fame and came out, you know, as the Undertaker, even for a moment like that, like stayed in character. Um, that guy, you know, and have have the fiend, you know, change for lack of a better word, the Undertaker back into uh, into the, you know, the dead man for his final farewell. Yes, you know, you're you're probably right considering that in 1990, when he was introduced and joined by Brother Love, is with his him be, uh, Brother Love being his manager, he would he came out as the Undertaker, so it would make sense that he would come out as the Undertaker, not just that Survivor Series, but also to end his career. I mean, that was the most successful version of his of himself, and you, I think I think you're right. Uh, but that's how I would book it. Now, I don't, I wouldn't put money on that WWE does this. I mean, there have been rumors floating around that this is truly it. It's just kind of a uh, a tribute, and we all say good night and thank you so much for your service. But see you later. I mean. It, if it happens again, I'll be very disappointed. But again, it's Taker, so he 
know you know that if you watch the documentary series about the last ride, which is one of the best documentary series I've ever seen with wrestling ever, that he would continue until his body said no. Like it's not the drive of within himself; it's his body that's limiting him. So, uh, you know that the desire is there from Mark. You know the desire is there. It's just can he do it? And I think he could, but what he'll struggle with, from what I've seen from the documentary, is that. Will he be satisfied with that? And I think he has to, in his mind, be at peace with whatever happens in this match. Win, lose, or draw, good match, bad match. This is what is. This is the end, no matter what. And I think that's the struggle he's going to have to have if they go through with this, because you know that he's always going to be like, oh, I can't end it like that. You know, I wasn't fully satisfied with my performance. I got to do another one, and he doesn't want to have that. You know, especially if it's his last match. But I think the struggle with him is going to be internal and understanding, yes, this is it. It's going to be the best I can possibly put forward. And it, whatever happens, happens. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I am. Um, All right. Again, that just that yeah, super great. No, I, no, go well, ahead. But did you go with Paul Bear, too, and the Brothers of Destruction? I mean, unbelievable. Oh, I saw the, I saw both. Uh, the Mortician and the Brothers of Destruction, and it, it's awesome to see Undertaker after being so quiet and be so being so protective of his character to come out and just all unleash this wave of doing Stone Cold's podcast and doing the five part documentary and the Last Ride and and the Brothers of Destruction and the Mortician. I'm sure we've got way more coming too, and it's it's great. I mean, this Undertaker has generated so much interest and so much content for the WWE Network. It's it's really it's fascinating to hear from him, the guy that's been so tight lipped about his career over the last 30 years to come out and probably the greatest of all time. I mean, yes, you could say Stone Cold generated more money and he was hotter. I'd agree. You could say The Rock was uh, a bigger star and I would agree. But the man that's been there the longest that has stood the test of time and that has earned more respect than anyone in the business ever and has had the longest reign, a running character, a successful character of all time is The Undertaker. I would say The Undertaker is the greatest of all time. I really would say that. I mean, of course, a very subjective uh, a subjective topic. But uh, So getting back to SmackDown, any, any I know, again, there's there's are things that happen on SmackDown, but I also want to get a jump into Survivor Series, the actual matches and predictions. But uh, are there any other, a couple of things that you wanted to touch on with SmackDown before we get to Survivor Series? How about this for a transition? I guess um, the the Natalia and um, and Tamina match, uh, <laughs> you know, for the qualifying for Survivor Series. I was, you know, I was thinking when I was watching this, I was like, Man, this is going to be you're going to have your first ever rant about Tamina on the unofficial WWE podcast because um, I love Tamina. Um, I think Tamina is great. I mean, I don't know why she wrestles in a leather jacket. I think that's terrible, um, but I think um, I think. I think she's so underutilized and like, I'm, I'm sitting here watching this match and I think, you know, Tamina's been around for a while. Uh, and I think she's got the look and I think she's, you know, she's decent in the ring, right? She doesn't even have to be that great in the ring. Cause she's so big compared to the other, uh, the other women. And, um, and I was, I was like, I was rooting for an, uh, Tamina in this match to get on the, not that it was going to go anywhere ever, but I mean, like even that little run she had with Bailey on um, this past year, I mean, Again, showed a little bit more of, of where Tamina, or, you know, who Tamina is. But so I was, I was upset. I thought that, you know, Natalia went over Tamina. I thought they were going to go for the over three, you know, on Natalia. Um, and also, like with that being said, too, talk about someone who's been around for a while, Natalia. I'm, I am so disappointed in the way that she's been booked. I think, like, again, I don't. I was never a Natalia fan personally. I don't like her personality, you know, from what I've seen outside of WWE as well. It's just not my kind of person. But like that's not you know neither here nor there. I think um, I think that she's got a lot to give. Whether you know whether she's just like the grizzled vet who puts over new talent. Like why are we using her as like you know this five year old throwing tantrums? I mean she stomped her foot at Adam Pearce on uh, on SmackDown. Like like she was throwing a tantrum. This is like a grown woman who's been you know the only female graduate of the Hart de- Dynasty. You know it was like. I, all around disappointed in, in the use of these two women. I'm really over Natalia. I'm, I, like you said, especially the, at least the way that they're presently presenting her, 
it's not becoming of somebody I would want to cheer for. And apparently she's supposed to be the baby face in this contest with her and Tamina this past week. And yeah, she made Tamina tap out. Uh, but the way that they've used her, not just this week, but it's a pattern of many, many months, many months, if not years, that she's been booked like this, where, I mean, number one, she's a terrible actress. I mean, bad. Mm -hmm. Like, she cannot mm -hmm. act at all. It's so superficial, and it's like the harder she tries, the worse she becomes, and I think that's where she's at. In the ring, look, I have so much respect for Natalia. I mean, obviously her heritage and her family, where she comes from is one of the biggest wrestling families of all time with the hearts. Absolutely. No problem there. It's just, again, her acting is atrocious. And if I have to see, like you said, a grown woman throw a temper tantrum and wear cat ears down to the ring. Like, I, I am sorry. Like, I just, I can't get on board with somebody like that. Uh, she's kind of boring at the same time. Like there's not a lot of depth to her character. Uh, she's shown flares at times of, you know, she's cut good promos in the past. Let's, let's be honest. She's, she has cut really good promos in the past, but this current iteration of her is really unwatchable, uh, in the ring. Again, she's very good. There's no question about that. And having Tamina in there as well, uh, Tamina is kind of like the, the person that, I don't know, WWE is hiring part-time. Like she's there gone for four months, randomly shows up in a women's battle Royal, wins it, goes away comes back um i think that she needs to tamina needs to wwe needs to shed the 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 perception that she is kind of like nia Jax light like she is the huh. kind of the nia Jax wannabe or the the, the like i don't know 2.0 version 2.0 of nia Jax. um I, I get that feeling when i see her i'm like oh that's i mean i always think of nia Jax and tamina they they have similar body types they have long hair they they have similar features so I think she needs to differentiate herself by, you know, giving her a microphone. Like, they don't ever let her speak, ever. She just shows up, usually loses a match, and goes away. Uh, and lost very quickly to Natalia. So, yeah, I didn't, I wasn't big on this match. Um, and, and like you said, her throwing a ten temper tantrum like a five-year-old, and she's a grown woman who's been in WWE for ten years. It's, yeah, it's, it's not endearing. Yeah, no, not at all. I was, and I would say the same thing. Give her a mic or, you know, Tamina, give her a mic or give her give her a talker. You know, I mean, we lost Lena Vega. I mean, that think about that pairing would have been great. Um, you know, I, I think about, again, like, just in, if you compare, you know, someone like Tamina or Natalia, even just like in-ring skills to some of the women on the roster who are some of the women on the Survivor Series teams, like, they're much more serviceable, I think, you know, than Alana who's, who's going to be supposedly is this big baby face in the Survivor Series match. Like, again, I just, you know, because she's not blonde or, you know, has, has lip fillers or Botox, you know, she's not getting the spotlight. I, I really think, I think, you know, I think they could do a lot more and they're, and, you know, typical WWE, they're, they're missing something here. And I don't, you know, and I don't think anybody looks into it. Cause like you said, I think Tamina is just kind of like the part-time Nia Jax, or I love that Nia Jax light. I mean, you know, they are both, I think, I think they're both part of that Samoan dynasty. I mean, do something with that, you know, put her in a faction with Roman Reigns. God knows, you know, uh, I don't even know if she's, um, they're both on SmackDown. Not that the brand split means anything, but, you know, do something. They just, yeah, I don't have faith while we, we could sit here and talk about the potential of both women, which I think is a real potential. They probably look at they, meaning WWE creative slash Vince and upper management, Look at both Nia Jax, or I'm sorry, uh, Tamina and Natalia as kind of the old guard. They look at them, especially Tamina or um, uh, Natalia, as kind of like the old guard. And they don't, they, they want that shiny new toy. They've always had that shiny new toy syndrome, especially Vince McMahon has. And they've got all these, this talent sitting in NXT waiting to be potentially called up. They've got a younger roster, and you look at these two women, they're, they're not exactly spring chickens, and they've been around a while. So I don't have any faith that outside of kind of being that the doorkeeper or the gatekeeper for incoming talent to beat and start a foundation from and, and get us an uh, actual credible win over, I don't see them ever being the center of the women's division just simply for the fact of there's too much other talent. And I think that WWE thinks they know what they already have in Natalia and Tamina. I think they believe they've already squeezed as much juice out of that as they can, and that 
this is not something that we think we can get much more out of. We know what we have. They've been here forever. You know, that's probably the way that they have solidified and cemented their position in WWE. I think they have a very confident opinion about where they are. I, I, so I'm, as we could sit here till we're blue in the face. I'm just, I don't know. I'm scared. I'm, I'm very, very hesitant to ever say they'll do something with them significant. So, okay. Uh, so one thing I want to talk about SmackDown too. How can we not talk about the contract signing with Drew McIntyre and uh, Roman Reigns? And they were invited to SmackDown, so at least we got the explanation that okay, they were invited. Who they were invited by, I don't know. Who apparently uh, Adam Pearce is running everything without explanation, and no one told us why or what kind of official he is. He's just a WWE official. I don't think that's a real title. He's just a supervisor. I, I don't know, but he just kind of all of a sudden came out of the woodwork and he's running everything. Uh, I I will say I enjoyed the segment with these two. I liked the biggest thing I liked about this was that they weren't on the microphone that they were holding. Like It's like they were having a conversation that we weren't supposed to hear. That I, I, I really like that. I don't think they would have been able to do that in a fan setting because the fans would have been too loud, but in an empty arena with just LED boards with fans, they were able to do this. I really liked that small thing they did because it made it feel a little bit more real. Uh, so that's the first thing. Did, what did you think about this segment? Yeah, I, I agree. I thought it was great. And like, um, and how they've really been paying attention to like, like you said, like little details, the no microphone, um, the way Roman Reigns was looking at Drew McIntyre the entire time, I like, I don't, I feel like he looks at everybody just like with these patronizing, you know, stares. Um, and I, and this little thing I saw, and I don't even know if they meant to do it on purpose, but I was thinking like the promo last week, Drew McIntyre said, you know, that he, he thinks of it as an honor to be a champion and, you know, Roman Reigns, you know, feels entitled to it. And you see like, you know, Drew McIntyre comes out, you know, dressed for the occasion. He's got a collared shirt on, you know, he's not in a suit and a tie, but he's got a collared shirt on. He looks nice. And you know, Roman Reigns comes out in his t-shirt and, you know, same thing. And I was thinking, you know, again, just like those little details. And I don't, I don't know if WWE creative is being that, that um, detailed for lack of a better term, but I think um, I, I noticed it. I appreciated it. And I, I love the dialogue between the two of them. I didn't even think of that. That's a good point about the attire that they were wearing. It subconsciously, I think, registered with me, but I didn't actually bring it to my conscious part of my brain until you mentioned it about the attire. And yes, it's almost as if Roman Reigns had disrespect written all over him right from the get-go by not even like, caring to dress for that occasion of a contract signing. And Drew actually took it a little more seriously and had more respect for the championships where we had Roman Reigns just kind of come out like he had just been, you know, came from the gym and he just put his shirt on and... uh and just strolled into the arena. And I like that as well. That That's a, that's a good point. And it is the attention to detail that is making this whole thing work. And simply for the fact that Roman Reigns feels infinitely more comfortable than he did his baby face. It's, it's literally like we're seeing the man, Joe just kind of come out on wrestling. He's no longer Roman Reigns. He's Joe. I know why I think is his last name. If I pronounce it correctly, we're seeing Joe come out and just be, himself and this is what i've been waiting for and fans have been saying see see how awesome this is and we are getting an awesome version of roman reigns to to drew's credit i think he stacks up very well against roman reigns their dialogue was awesome uh the ending the, i guess the money quote was that roman reigns left it by saying drew you will always be my favorite number two that is I mean, does it get, does it get any more disrespectful? And yet he's constantly commanding respect, and he's always disrespecting the people he's in the ring with. I mean, this is this is brilliant stuff. Yeah, I have that same line written down. I think I mean Roman Reigns is he's just so plays the part so well. Like you said, like it sounds like he's just being himself. I think uh, I think this is how fans seem to have viewed him for however long, and just like being masked. I like this, you know, John Cena wannabe baby face, but like, this is the man underneath. And, and I don't know if that's the story. I'm sure he's a great guy, but, um, but he is so good at just being a jerk. Um, and, uh, and like I said, like I want, when he comes up on my screen, I was telling you before, you know, my, my girlfriend is a casual fan who kind of just tunes in for the pay-per-views and from time to time. And when she sees him on the screen, you know, she boos, she gets mad. And when I see him on my screen, like I want to hit him in the face or I want to see somebody hit him in the face. 
Like, that's how I'm supposed to feel about a heel. He's not, like, a cool heel. Like, he's a jerk. I don't, you know, I don't like the character of Roman Reigns. And, and it's like the one, they finally got it right. That's it. That is what people have been missing. That's why so many people love the Randy Orton heel turn, uh, or heel turn, but the continued heel run and brilliant heel run that he had in the spring and summer that got, I think, short changed by Keith Lee and several losses to Drew McIntyre. Um, but when you you feel that way about a heel that you literally want to, you would pay to see them get their ass kicked, then you have done your job. WWE has done their job. So heels like Orton and the, the brilliance they did with him over the summer and now Roman Reigns, you don't feel this way very often. How many more heels in WWE could you name that you would actually pay money to see somebody be, get you know beat them up? It's a very short list. And when people get angry, I think that's an emotion that WWE really underestimates a lot of times because they're, literally their mission statement, they will say how many times over and over and over, I think it's tattooed on Stephanie's forehead at this point, that we put smiles on people's faces. I mean, she said it 300 times during the WrestleMania part one and part two. Uh, she says it in every press, or she, every press conference she does. It is just, it, it's, it's really just stomach churning how often they say it. So when people get angry at characters, that's money. People, you know, it doesn't always have to be a, a happy ending all the time because when you have a hot heel, guess what's going to, it's going to create hot baby faces. You want that dynamic. You want to have that feeling of, oh my God, I want to see somebody just pound their face in that you want anger because it creates a build towards that release of happiness. Like that's what you want. And we're getting it with Roman Reigns. It's just getting, it's more brilliant by the week. Uh, Jay Uso being his kind of uh, lackey and servant now is great, not just for Roman, but for Jay Uso. How, how, uh, how much more relevant is Jay Uso now after just a month of working with Roman Reigns and the awesome story they told with Hell in a Cell? I mean, so everything Roman's touching and everyone Roman Reigns is touching right now is, is just turning to gold and uh, credit to Roman Reigns, credit to WWE. And how, how many people actually thought this? Let me ask you this. How do, if if you were presented with this Roman Reigns heel turn storyline and Paul Heyman was put with you, you would have probably thought, wow, it's going to be key that we have somebody to talk for Roman because it's not exactly his strong suit. Paul Heyman is going to be a perfect fit because he's going to be able to you know turn people against Roman if they start to cheer or whatever. Paul Heyman's been almost a non-factor. How I mean. When's the last time that happened? Did you, could you have imagined Paul Heyman being put with somebody and Paul Heyman is actually almost not needed? Yeah, I mean, the, the only person who comes to mind is, I guess, CM Punk. But, I mean, he I don't even know if he was really, you would consider him a Paul Heyman guy, but he was such a, he's so good on the mic that he, he didn't really need Paul to talk for him. And, and, I mean, I think this is the same thing. I mean, their interaction, right, there was no no physical interaction. And, like, that's how good, right, like, the, each promo was they didn't there was no no one need to punch anyone or put someone through the stereotypical right contract signing announce table to build towards the match it actually I think it helped that it was just you know verbal between the two of them that you know no one was hitting any anyone and I I, I agree I think I, I've been watching uh talking smack from time to time too and, and Paul's the co-host with um I can't remember her name she's not Kayla Braxton uh and I mean he's hilarious on it but he's he's taken on the role too. He's like barely talking on that show too. He's really kind of taken a back seat and, um, and let Roman shine. And I think Roman's really filled the shoes. I mean, who, who would have thought, like I said, it really does. It feels like Roman is playing himself and like all these, you know, these six years or whatever, he's been, you know, playing somebody who he's not. Well, he has, I mean, and, and I look, I, I've actually met Roman Reigns in person. We met, uh, at the mall here, the, the big mall that's near Albany. And, uh, he, I mean, he's exactly the way that you would imagine. He is a very laid back kind of like humble man, but deep down, you're probably thinking this guy's got a big ego and, and, and is arrogant, but will never show it. Uh, it, it, which, I mean, if you do, you do, and you don't show it. I mean, I guess it's all speculation, but you just get that sense and you're like, oh, you would be such a good heel because you could let it out. And that's what I feel like I'm seeing is the the face mask of the baby face corporate creation has been lifted. And now we're seeing more of what we thought was there anyway that came across through this mask of 
of this corporate creation that it's like, stop with this facade. Let's see it. What's underneath because we know what's underneath is more authentic. That's what I feel like we're seeing in this version of Roman Reigns, which is why it's working so damn well. So you, know, you talk to anybody or listen to any interview of really big stars, they will tell you in wrestling, they'll tell you that the most successful characters in wrestling are who they really are in real life turned up to 10. I mean, like really, really like obviously uh, uh, magnified. I mean, of course, they're not going to be, you know, going out. Austin's not going to be going out and flipping people off on the street and, you know, dumping beer on them. <laughs> but it's it's like that. You take that piece of you that's there and magnify the hell out of it. And that's what I think and why Roman Reigns is so successful and why I hope and pray that they do not cut this heel run short. I want to see Roman Reigns heel for, I mean, a year, two years maybe, because what I think is going to happen, and I'm, I'm going to ask if you agree, and if you don't, that's I'm, I'm very curious to hear your, your opinion on this, is after this heel run is over, do you think that he will – when he turns back babyface, be the level of the babyface, the size of the, the the reaction that Vince has been really after to begin with will happen. Like, do you think turning him heel will actually make him the biggest babyface the company has to the level that they hoped he would be at when they first enforced the six-year run babyface uh, character down our throats? Do you think that's possible, or do you think that when he turns back babyface, it'll kind of just be like back to the same old Roman Reigns kind of mixed reaction? I think if if he's got a good partner, um, but I, I do think I think that there's there's definitely high chance of a, of, of a successful babyface run, just because you think about like all the big baby faces in history. You know, most had had you know started off as a heel. I mean, even John Cena, we were. Like uh, the doctor of thugonomics for a while. I mean, people were booing John Cena. He came out. He was like a, a annoying little, you know, white rapper. Like it was perfect, perfect thing for like the male demographic at you know at that time or whatever to be booing and hating. And um and then right then is able to turn into a baby face in this weird WWE dynamic where you need time to be able to hate someone before you're allowed to like cheer for them. And I think um I think like I said before too, right? Like you know the fans appreciate good work. And, um, and so seeing Roman Reigns put in like this amazing, like we said, like an amazing heel run, good work, good work in the ring, good work on the mic, right. Is only going to do, um, it's only going to be for his favor when he, uh, when he eventually turns baby face, but I'm, I'm with you. I hope, I think this, this heel run is so good that I can't even picture a baby face run. And I think, um, I think that's the exciting part about it. Um, I'm with you. I too, I, I hope it goes for a while and I'm wondering, you know, like you said, I don't want it cut short. Do you fear the fate of Randy Orton happening to Roman Reigns? Do you see, you know, if Drew McIntyre goes over Roman Reigns, do you see that heel heat, you know, dimmering? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I mean, I I think, and, and I guess uh, we'll, we'll get into our predictions in a minute, but I, without giving away my prediction, I think if... Roman Reigns loses, I think that would hurt him more than if Drew McIntyre loses. So, I mean, I, I guess I'll I'll leave it at that to, to keep you guys hooked to, to my thoughts because I don't think that's a match that's actually super easy to predict, but it's a match that, because I think there's a lot of possibility of interference in that match. Um, no titles are on the line, so, you know, the, the, there's, there's that removed from it. It's just simply personal. It's the best of the best, but... Uh, yeah, for my limited answer, I I would think Roman would probably lose something. I would think he, I think he would lose more than Drew would if he lost. So I'll leave it at that. But uh, is there anything else uh, on SmackDown that you want to chat about before we get to Survivor Series? Yeah, I mean we can we can make it quick. And I just I guess I want to hear your thoughts on the um, hopefully what is the end of the um, the Buddy Murphy and mm -hmm. Seth Rollins program and the Mysterio family. Yes. Alleluia. I believe it's over. Pun intended to the Messiah. Alleluia. Um, yeah, I, I think, and th this better be the end of it. And from all accounts I'm hearing, I mean, we have Becky Lynch who's due soon for her baby. So you would think that Seth Rollins maybe takes a bit of a sabbatical and takes time with his wife and his, his newborn child 
And uh, I think that's probably what's going to happen, given Seth Rollins is also on a decline from, from in terms of professionally. I mean, he has lost a lot lately. He lost a big match at WrestleMania. He lost to Drew McIntyre uh, for the WWE Championship. He, he uh, He's really not had any significant wins and has been stuck in this five-month rut with... Uh, the whole Mysterio family conundrum, which started out actually, I started out really enjoying it and then was just completely shattered and burned into the ground, resurrected and killed again. It, it, that's the, it felt very, very, very overrun. And uh, I th- I'm sure Seth felt the same way. We all think, oh, he's going to SmackDown. He's going to be, you know, refreshed. And he's not. I mean, it's right back in the, you know, he, that, that program did not leave him. And now that it's completely over, I am thankful. I think everyone should be thankful that it's completely over. Uh, and we can move the hell on. And, you know, we can have Seth Rollins do something of relevancy. Do something that is just ignore this the last few months for Seth Rollins. This has been not good for Seth. I think it's been good for Dominic to show the fans what he can do. Probably more than mo- most people thought. Uh, and Rey Mysterio to stay relevant, and most importantly for me, Murphy, and we can call him Buddy Murphy on the show. I'm a fan of uh, you know calling Matt Riddle Matt Riddle and uh, Buddy Murphy Buddy Murphy. So yeah, this has been really good for Murphy, Buddy Murphy. I think this is going to help his career in a big way. He showed he can actually act a little bit. Uh, he has some range as a character. He's absolutely outstanding in the ring. And you pair him with Seth Rollins, I mean, you're going to get, you, you know, you're going to get a, a, an automatic, like, you know, four star match. Like, it's just, it's just guaranteed. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I loved the fact that it's over, but I like the fact that Mur- Buddy Murphy has gotten a little bit of a foundation to build himself upon. And I do think that Seth Rollins is going to take some time off for his family, whenever that may be, and just, uh, reset and, and, and reconfigure and recalibrate his character and himself and i think that's exactly what his character needs in a big way yeah i i agree i mean i thought the match was amazing too and um i'm i'm hoping that you know uh bunny murphy does not go uh you know into obscurity or you know come uh is able to is able to bounce back from this i don't i don't know what they're going to do if Aaliyah is going to follow him down to the ring i don't know how they're going to you know maybe there's a mysterio buddy murphy program that helped me. Um, but, uh, but I, like you said, I thought the match was amazing. The only thing that I was a little confused about, and again, I don't know if you noticed this too, but like, uh, why is the heel, right? Like the Messiah, Seth Rollins, who had AOP and Buddy Murphy and Austin Theory for, you know, a hot second. Why is he the one who's outnumbered? You notice like the entire Mysterio family came out with Buddy. And um, I mean, I guess it was a payoff, but I mean, like what a sad payoff on, on SmackDown before Survivor Series, like that's the payoff to this five month, um, five month rivalry, I guess. Um, but like you said, I'm 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 happy that it's over. I'm happy that Buddy Murphy got to shine a little bit in this rivalry. I hope they, you know, give him something good next. I hope he sheds this Mysterio family like in laws gimmick he's got going on and, and can um and can can continue to show the personality that he showed because I think like he, I think he could really be just as good. Maybe not just as good on the mic, but you know, as he is in the ring, but but decent enough where um, or like I think he would, I think the fans would be behind him if you know if we had him in the arena right now. Yeah, they probably would be because I think they would see the the misuse of him right now and the tired storyline that they're in. I think and and the fans know what he's capable of, and they would I think revolt and start cheering Seth Rollins simply for the fact that you're right. I mean, they know the fans know what's going on, and they would say let's move on, right and the dynamic that you brought up about Seth Rollins being outnumbered, he's the heel. I, I mean, I've been screaming that from the rooftops for the last several months that, look, Seth Rollins, not only is as a heel, typically, most of the time, you have the heel outnumber the babyface. That's, sim- that's just like kind of pro wrestling 101. But on top of it, his character calls for other people to follow him. He's the Messiah. Well, where the hell are his disciples? You know, you had, yes, AOP, which I think were awesome fits with Seth Rollins. And I I really am just sad that not only did they get injured too soon, but then WWE released them. I was hoping that upon their return, they would come back with Seth and we're off to the races again. And obviously that's not the case. 
and then Murphy and him started to have some, you know, some kind of scuffle. Then he's back with them. He's not. Then they fight. Then they're back. And now they took they they took the hard split. I, they are done. Like that is good. But at the same time, not only does a heel normally have an outnumber an outnumber the baby face, but also if you have a character that really calls for you to have people, considering you're a messiah and you need disciples, it's double the the hit here on Seth Rollins, which is why I think. That I, I don't know if he needs to drop the, the the whole Messiah thing upon his return after his baby is born and he takes over when he, how much time he needs, but maybe he needs to just come back you know with with I don't know like three people you know I, I don't know who they may be but he needs those heaters he needs people to follow him otherwise his character has no credibility. Yeah yeah I couldn't agree more I think um. I think that was to me like like you said it was it, it burned hot and it burned fast you know when he, um when he came out with AOP and again I liked I love the the dynamic of you know when someone was down when he would come and, and pick him up and like get them at the weakest moment I thought that was such a good heel move and um uh, and I wish I don't know why I don't know why they released AOP I don't know why they went away with that I you know I don't know why Austin Theory suddenly disappeared and there was no explanation behind that um, maybe because they wanted this, you know, Buddy Murphy rivalry, and and he was just a a third a third wheel. I don't know. I thought um I thought it, it was really good for what it was, and 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 I think it should have continued. I think you know it could have been a, a much better thing than it was. I think you know um, but but like you said, I hope he gets to go away um for a little while and and comes back. I I hope he comes back as the Messiah character, and I hope they get like a second try at this, and he does it you know better and longer this time because I really I think. You know, not only does, you know, Seth Rollins has that, like, look to him, but he just, he like you said, he's got an annoying voice. He's just a, a natural heel, and um, and he's, like, got a natural grimy, like, sliminess to him that fit with, with his gimmick of going, you know, picking up people when they were down, uh, recruiting them, for lack of a better term. It was, um, like, the religious undertones to it. It was all done so well, but so short. Yeah, it, it, that's exactly what it was. I, we never... I never felt like I got the full potential, the full fleshed out story of the Messiah. I, I mean, due to injury, obviously COVID didn't help. Then the firing of AOP, Murphy was kind of back and forth here, there, not there, gone. Not, no, it was very wishy-washy there. There's been no solid, here's the group that Seth Rollins has. He's brainwashed these people. He came to them at their weakest moment, which is the most coward thing to do. And he basically tried to, he said that, he saved them. I mean, all the psychology was good. The baseline was good, but they never fleshed it out. Like they just kind of like willy nilly, no explanation. Then Seth is on his own and without people following him, how can he be a Messiah? If he has no disciples, there really was no like solid follow through plan for this. It was just, eh, Seth Rollins has a solid character as the Messiah. It's like, but no, he doesn't. Right. Like, I, I don't know. So, uh, okay. Well, before I get on a rant about that, uh, was uh, any, any, anything else before we jump on Survivor Series? I don't think so. You want to um, where where you want to start? Well, let's see here. Let's pull up the card, which will probably change. It always does. Every time I do one of these preview shows, WWE throws like a wrench in here where they put something on the pre-show that was on the main card, or vice versa, or they just add a random match before the show. But as it stands. Uh, late Saturday night, for those that are, are wondering if we cover if we don't cover a match that randomly popped up, well, that's because WWE likes to throw a wrench in last minute. So I'll start off here with the the very first match on the card: Team Raw, AJ Styles, Keith Lee, Sheamus, Braun Strowman, and Matt Riddle. I can't say Riddle. I feel like I feel stupid saying it. I mean, it's Matt Riddle uh, versus Team SmackDown. Kevin Owens, Jey Uso, King Corbin, Seth Rollins, and Otis. Oh my God, that hurts to say. In a five-on-five Survivor Series elimination match. Take it away, Mimi. What do you think? Uh, I have to go with Team Raw on this one, just because I think um, I think Team SmackDown can take a loss more so. You know, uh, King Corbin is just that's just his mo. Uh, Kevin Owens has kind of been on that same trajectory. Uh, I think it could, you know, spark something, something with Jey Uso and Roman Reigns, you know, failed to lead the team to victory. 
he said Seth Rollins is probably going away right now. And, you know, Otis, again, has been on that same path with Corbin and Kevin Owens. So I think uh, when you look at the two teams, I think I think SmackDown is, is able to take this loss. But with that being said, though, I have to say, you know, the whole stereotypical gimmick of, you know, they can't get along, uh, you know, on Raw, that could throw a wrench in my in my prediction but uh, I do I think you know I think it'll be if anything will happen it'll be something like that uh Survivor Series match and again I'm going to blank on the year but you know Roman Reigns uh speared uh uh King Corbin oh it was last year it was last year because NXT was involved you know Roman Reigns turned on King Corbin still managed to win the match but um but there was some uh dissension and I think that's what led into that like you know four year what felt like a four year long rivalry between King Corbin and Roman Reigns so, so that's my pick, I guess. Long story short, is Raw, and hopefully there's some kind of dissension in between, so we can take this worthless match and create some kind of story out of it. Whether it's you know Braun Strowman and Sheamus, whatever it is, and we get a program going forward. What do you think? Yeah, um, and I'm, I'm having flashbacks as you mentioned about Baron Corbin and Roman Reigns with dog food being thrown on Roman Reigns. Um, yeah, they. This looks like it's a solid win for Team Raw. I mean, just because. For some of the reasons you mentioned, when you look at the team, the makeup of the SmackDown team, Kevin Owens, we WWE seems to just kind of put him to the side and, and elevate him to the mid-upper card and then push him kind of back down, and then, then he's not there, and then he's just doing a KO show. And the way that they've mishandled Kevin Owens is another story, but that tells me they don't really care if he takes a loss. You have King Corbin. How many times has he lost? I mean, he his win-loss record has got to be abysmal. i got to look it up. Seth Rollins has been on the de- the, de- the decline. Otis, we all know what I feel and to some degree you feel about Otis. Jay Uso, uh, I would say he's the only hot hand here, although he lost this past week to Daniel Bryan. So when you put all these guys together, it doesn't spell a victory to me. And when you look at Team Raw, not only does Team SmackDown have a lot of the, the individuals that WWE has kind of pushed to the side as of late other than Jay Uso, you have Keith Lee. Number one, and you have Matt Riddle, number two. Those two guys, in and of itself, would be enough reason to possibly push him, push this team in the victory column because you want Keith Lee to have a good showing. He's an up and coming star. You have Matt Riddle, up and coming star. You want them to have good showings and have a potentially big victory over Team SmackDown for whatever it's worth for this fake band rivalry. Uh, plus, AJ Styles has his associate. I wonder if he may or may not play a factor in this. I think he may. Uh, So this to me is one of the more predictable outcomes, which scares me when I see predictable because I've been burned countless times on predictable outcomes. But I'm with you. Team Raw, I think, will pull this one out. Uh, I feel pretty confident about this one. Yeah, I think this will be the the, the one, one... If only match that that Team Raw looks looks confident in taking out. Yeah, I I, I think so too. I mean, it, again, this is just nothing more than the pay per view. I've said this before. This is like the bragging rights pay per view. Like they might as well just rename this bragging rights because there's nothing else on the line here. So, uh, okay, well, on to the women's Survivor Series five on five elimination match. Team Raw: Nia Jax, Shayna Baszler, Lana. Lacey Evans and Peyton Royce versus Team SmackDown, Bianca Belair, Ruby Riot, Liv Morgan, Bailey, and Natalia. I'm going to toss this one once again to you. What do you think? Um, I think that this Lana, uh, Nia Jax, Tina Baszler table storyline has has got more thought or detailed thought from creative than than half the storylines you know on that that three hour show. Um, I mean, they teased us with it. You know, Nia Jax has pretended to walk back to the back and then been like, nope, we're going to throw her through a table. Or, you know, we didn't think we didn't get it in the beginning of the show. And then later on in the show, it happens. I mean, they have put more thought into this Lana going through a table than, um, than like I said, probably this entire pay-per-view. Um, and so so I'm guaranteeing that that's probably going to happen, right? Some kind of shenanigans with the announce table, Nia Jax and Lana. I don't think that the payoff for this weird, weird rivalry is going to be at um, Survivor Series. I think they're going to wait till TLC and do some kind of tables match, uh, which is a whole nother uh, conversation. But 
but because of that, I, I have a feeling that we're probably going to um, end up with a SmackDown win tonight. And uh, not a, you know, I know people are saying that Lana is going to come and have this, you know, cheap victory at the end or something. But I, I think you've got someone like Bianca Belair on SmackDown. I hope that they give her a big showing. I hope that they use, like, again, they use this worthless match on a worthless pay-per-view to at least create some kind of star out of Bianca Belair. Um I think Liv Morgan is going to have some kind of flashbacks from the elimination chamber when she sees Shayna Baszler. Uh, and I think, uh, I think Lacey Evan and Peyton Royce are going to be eliminated in the first five minutes. Cause I don't know what, what they're doing with that. I mean, they broke up the best and few of women's tag teams on that roster to put Peyton Royce back on another tag team with a, uh, with Lacey Evans. So I don't get it. I, I don't, I, I'm so disappointed in this match. I mean, you look at last year's, I know they had NXT too, but um, some of the names on these teams, it's just, it's disappointing uh, with, with all the women's talent that they have, you know, with the lack of a, of a build that they've done for any of these women as credible, credible wrestlers. But, um, but with all that being said, like I said, I think I'm going to have to go with team SmackDown solely for my, you know, false hope and creative uh, that they're going to give Bianca Belair a good showing. What do you think? This match is not easy. It's not as easy as the men's match to predict. And I have been saying for weeks, and I will stand by it, that I've said Lana will do exactly what you said she could do in pull out a cheap victory. She gets put through a table for the 10th time early in the match by Nia Jax after they have some kind of scuffle and bam, she goes through and we all supposed to forget about her. And then team SmackDown will eliminate the remaining raw members and it'll leave Lana left and we'll go, Oh my God, wait, team raw didn't lose. Lana never got eliminated. She's hanging out on the outside. That's right. And maybe she's able to pull off a cheap, like you said, a cheap victory and win it for team raw. The most unlikely person ever to you know be the final survivor for the women's division. And that, I think, still is a strong possibility. But like you said, perhaps they do something here that uh, maybe Lana costs Nia Jax a pinfall. And she, Nia Jax is eliminated. And then she gets angry, puts Lana through a table. Team Raw loses. And uh, Lana is eliminated and then gets put through a table. And then we end up at a tables match, like you said, at TLC. I think that is also equally possible. I also think it's possible that... Uh, you have Lana win, which is, this is my official prediction. I think Lana still squeaks out the victory because of how hard they're working to bury Lana as an impossible uh, victor in this match. Like they are going to the nth degree to make her timid, to have her slam through a table every week, to try to, you know, get some acceptance from her teammates. It's just, they are burying her character, which I really took as a sign of, okay, she's getting the win at survivor series. So I'm going to go with that, but they could still get to that tables match at TLC by having Nia Jax take her anger out, yet Lana wins, and Nia Jax is still angry at her, and Lana ends up, I don't know, again, facing her at, at uh, TLC. So, yeah, my my story is Lana wins by, uh, by hook or crook with a roll-up at the end of the match, or someone comes back to lay out the final SmackDown competitor, and Lana just kind of crawls into the, puts her, drapes her arm over the person in the ring to get the victory, and you have the announcer saying, in the most unlikely of finishes, I mean, and, and Lana, I think, will end up being victorious. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take that. I know it's a popular opinion, but it, to me, I know it also puts another victory in Raw's column. But Vince has never been shy about Raw sweeping SmackDown at Survivor Series or getting a solid victory over SmackDown. Because honestly, this rivalry, again, means nothing. There's no consequence. So I'm not even looking at SmackDown versus Raw wins because there is no consequence. So that's my thought. Yeah, you're you're slowly convincing me as you're as you're talking, but I don't know. I'm, I'm again, maybe it's false hope, man. But I'm I'm really hoping they they do something again. You know, the SmackDown team has Bailey. I really hope they don't have Bailey take another loss. You know, I think they have one um, one disposable in Natalia, but um, I'd like to see them do something with the Riot Squad. Maybe look look make make them look like a you know a viable tag team to challenge for the uh, women's tag team titles. Like I think there's a lot 
that they can do here to, to book for the future, you know? And again, like I said, kind of a worthless match. I think there's a lot of possibility in, in creating some stories out of it, but um, we'll have to see what they do. Yeah. And you I know you're, you're concerned about Bailey or, or uh, you know, whoever, but Bailey as a heel could just leave the match in frustration. She never takes the loss. She just gets angry at her teammates and leaves. That way she's not pinned. She saves face and she gets more heat for abandoning her teammates. So, that, if, if you're concerned about Bailey, I mean, that's absolutely a possibility. So, all right. Uh, third match here, Bobby Lashley versus Sami Zayn, United States champion versus Intercontinental champion. Uh, I'm going to say, I'll, I'll take this one first. Um, boy, I'm going to say Sami Zayn wins, not just because I want him to win, but because I think it's the right move. Bobby Lashley losing, I don't think would hurt him nor the hurt business. But with Sami Zayn losing this past week on SmackDown and how good he is on the mic and good at bragging, I would I think Sami Zayn should win this match. I'm expecting a very good match. Both men are very good in the ring. And storyline wise, I think Sami Zayn can benefit more than Bobby Lashley winning. Even though I know he's attached to the hurt business, Bobby Lashley losing, I don't think especially if it's by some kind of crook. Hooker Crook by Sami Zayn, who was the master strategist, as he called himself. I think you could see Bobby Lashley losing this from Sami Zayn's just underhanded tactics um, in a heel versus heel match. So that's also interesting that they've positioned it that way. But it is what it is with them being champions. So Sami Zayn wins. I feel fairly confident about that. What about you? Yeah, I actually I have the same pick as you, Sami Zayn. But, you know, I... I think that that Sami Zayn could probably eat the loss more than Bobby Lashley right now but like you said I think um I think Sami Zayn's gonna have you know what he did to Apollo Crews on um on Smackdown I think it's gonna be some kind of hook or crook thing where Sami Zayn pulls out the victory and is able to like you said brag about it that way you know uh Sami Zayn gets the win but Bobby Lashley doesn't really take the loss um so you're not hurting either guy kind of a cheap thing WWE seems to love doing that 50-50 booking but um, but I don't I I'm hoping they give him more time. But I honestly don't think, like you said, it's a heel versus heel match. I don't think they're going to get a lot of time to show off um some, like an actual good match. I think it's probably going to be you know under five ten minutes and and uh, and Sami Zayn's going to pull out a like like I said a cheap victory. But uh, I'm with you. I think Sami Zayn's going to win this one. Yeah, no no question. And uh, again, we all have to remember there's no championships on the line. It's nothing but just exhibition matches. I mean, this is just what this is. So that certainly adds uh, some a big factor to how I'm picking the matches, and I'm sure you as well. So, okay, uh, another match. And this, this next one could certainly be the match of the night. I'm really looking forward to this again from a match-only perspective storyline. Uh, it doesn't really exist. It's all about the quality of the match, wrestling, the, the athleticism, which I'm always against. But in this case, it will certainly shine. And that is the New Day, Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods, who are the Raw Tag Team Champions versus the Street Profits, who are the SmackDown Champions. Who do you think wins this? And do you think this could be the match of the night as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think... Um... I think, you know, all four, all four men seem to have a, a, a good respect for each other, you know, on and off camera. And, um, and they're all super talented. I also think, uh, I think, uh, what's it called? I think the New Day would be happy to put over the Street Profits, um, but, you know, in, in like a passing the torch kind of way. But I really, you know, I think I'm going to go with a, uh, uh, a differing opinion than what I've heard mostly. And I, I'm going to say the New Day pulls this one off. Uh, and I think that because, you know, they just came back. They just split off from Big E. If you notice, most matches, you know, they had, it was either Kofi or Woods and Big E. Um, you know, it was rarely just Kofi and Woods uh, in the match. And so I think they need to show some kind of, some kind of ability to, to be a tag team without Big E. Um, and I also think, I think they're not ready to pass the torch yet. I think, pass the torch at a, at a match like on Survivor Series just seems silly. I think like this is something, right, WWE is going to see something good in this match and they are going to show it to us every week, probably on both shows, bury it into the ground, like you said, bring it back to life and kill it again. Um, that's like like an Aleister Black, uh, Buddy Murphy kind of deal. So I think we're going to see the New Day win and, uh, and hopefully later on down the line, maybe in a year, maybe less than a year, you're going to have the, these, these guys facing off again. And then that's kind of when the Street Profits are going to, going to take the victory. And hopefully that'll have some more, you know, uh, 
relevancy or mean more. Maybe it's a unification match. Maybe it's just for the titles and there's some kind of another draft or trade or whatever they do. But I think um, I think the New Day pulls this one off uh, clean in the ring. Uh, no hook or crook. Just, uh, just a great match, like you said. What do you think? This one is not as easy for me to pick as it was for you. And I think it's because of the – in the back of my mind, it's the uh, – for Vince anyway, it's the deranged – syndrome of shiny toy shiny toy syndrome right like and the street profits have gotten a lot more camera time as of late the, the trend has been up for them uh, and how many times we have to see montez ford from the heavens jump off the top rope uh i mean great I mean, granted it's an insanely high move. i mean i don't think i've ever seen anyone jump that high off the top rope i mean ever and i've been watching wrestling for 20 some years uh, and and so certainly the athleticism is athleticism is there I think it's going to be the shiny new toy syndrome for Vince. I, I really think that the street profits are going to pull this one off because new day losing, they don't lose the tag team championships. So that doesn't really matter per se. And the street profits again, seem to be getting a lot of on air time. They're opening. I think they opened SmackDown this week with their, their whole over the top delivery of their lines and everything else, which again, I'm not a fan of. It doesn't mean they're bad. Just not my taste. And, I think the Tree Profits have a bright future, and I think the New Day, WWE knows what they have with them. They know that they can take a loss because the championships aren't on the line, and that, like you said, this is going to be an ongoing program in the future. Given the fact that they're both on SmackDown and Raw, makes it a little bit more difficult, but WWE doesn't really care about their own rules when it comes to the draft because they don't have rules. Um, or they just make them up as they go. So I could see these two absolutely meeting once again, and I'm, I'm sure that they wish they were all on the same brand. Uh, but I think the Street Profits pull this one out. From the heavens, we have Montez Ford probably pin uh, Xavier Woods, who is the weak link. There's always a weak link, weak link on a team, and I think Xavier is that. So that's my thought on uh, on that. But um, Okay, uh, two more matches. Asuka and Sasha Banks, and then Drew and Roman Reigns. Asuka versus Sasha Banks, take it away. Oh, so before we get to that, I have to ask you the more important question about the New Day versus the Street Profits. You know, everybody's yeah. been everybody's talking about it. Do you think the Street Profits come out with blue solo cups? Oh, please no. <laughs> <laughs> please no. No, I, I know that that is, a, that, that is a, just a earth-shattering question. I hope not. Uh, I'm. I don't like the Solo Cup deal. So, uh, but I would. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. But I please no. Please no. <laughs> please. Uh, yeah, those little. The yeah, do you think? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. You know what? This one I just can't predict. I think we're gonna have to wait and see. Um, but on that note, Asuka versus Sasha. I think. Um, actually, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on on the. Um, their, their, you know, face off on SmackDown, which I, you know, I know you've talked about how you're not a big fan of how Oscar's kind of become a joke. And, and I agree with you. I, I did. I have to say I popped at the John Cena. You can't see me. I thought that was hilarious. But, um, but I, I want to hear, I guess, your thoughts on, on that whole face, face off interaction. I thought it was awkward. I thought Sasha Banks was not great on the mic. I just, I thought that whole uh, segment was, was bad, but I, I'm curious to hear what you think. Yeah, it wasn't great. I mean, it was um, it was cringeworthy at times, and I say this a lot when I see segments like this. I mean, I've certainly seen worse, way worse, but a segment like this, I wouldn't want somebody who I'm friends with to try to get them into wrestling to watch a segment like this. Like this is this is the opposite of what I want them to see if I'm trying to you know, get somebody into this. And uh, yeah, this was uh, this was a little uncomfortable to watch because it was just not good. Uh, I mean, I'd give it like a D. I mean, it was it wasn't passing. It was just kind of like, ugh. I mean, certainly seen worse. But this interaction, yeah, it was awkward. Um, Asuka being the flamboyant kind of screaming in Japanese. And uh, the, yeah, the John Cena thing was was probably the only thing out of the whole segment that was worth even discussing because we had Asuka just being kind of just screaming, screaming Japanese until she gets to, and no one's ready for Asuka. I mean, like she just does that over and over. And Sasha Banks conversely, wasn't much better. As you said, she just, I feel like she hasn't really found her promo voice. Uh, she found a little bit during Bailey 
during that whole, which I don't even think, I mean, I'm not trying to be down here, but I, I've, I've buried the way that they've handled Sasha Banks and Bailey after a brilliant buildup. I don't think they paid it off very well, uh, but this was not good. And having Carmella attack Sasha Banks for the third week in a row, I think was actually the saving grace of this whole thing. I know that people are down on Carmella. I am not. I am actually a little more, a more high on Carmella than most people because I know what she was like a SmackDown Women's Champion. She was really good as SmackDown Women's Champion. People forget how good she was, and. Yes, minus James Ellsworth and all that nonsense. I'm not talking about James Ellsworth and all all of that. But Carmella kind of repackaged in a way with her red latex outfit and uh, her bleach blonde hair. Now it's not like, you know, highlighted. It's just straight bleach blonde is a nice distraction and also bringing somebody into the forefront that was in the background for quite a while. It, it makes her feel fresh, even though she's been with WWE for quite a while. Um, yeah, this was not good. Not good uh, for either woman. Uh, I was not a fan of this. And if Sasha Banks calls somebody sweetheart one more time as if it's like some kind of backhanded compliment, I mean, I, it, it's 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 hard to hear and watch, um, given I know the talent in the ring. And again, they're both extremely talented. So long story short, short is that my prediction for this is I think Sasha, mm, you know what, I think Asuka wins because I think Carmella interferes and screws Sasha Banks uh, for the fourth time and really gets her attention and Oscar picks up the victory, albeit a somewhat tainted one. What do you think? Yeah, I, I thought about that um, too. I was thinking, you know, but I, I, my thought was, I just thought, you know, they're pushing Oscar as a baby face. Like I know, um, I know they've done it before, but do they really want to have her winning because of an interference from Carmella? Um, I'm actually, I'm going to go, Matt. I, I think it's, it's boss time. And I think uh, Sasha Banks is going to take this one um, just because, you know, they're they're now just establishing a new champion. I really think they've shown that they kind of couldn't care less about Asuka. You know, if I were to book this, I'd be with you. I'd have Asuka go over. I think she needs a big victory. Um, uh, but I think uh, I think WWE, like you said, has got that new shiny toy syndrome. And, and Sasha's kind of uh, is the, the new uh, the new big thing. But but I did think, though, the only other only other saving grace of this match could be, and, and not because it's going to be a bad match at all, but just because, again, we've seen it before, um, could be that uh, that maybe, like, someone not Carmella interferes. Maybe we get a returning Charlotte Flair. Maybe we get someone else, you know, from the Raw roster that we haven't seen in a while returns. And, again, I'm, I'm praying that they're going to use at least one of these matches to start a program afterwards, and uh, but interferes and in, uh, results in a program with Asuka. Um, give her something to do besides... Uh, those, those, I, I thought it was funny, but that hilarious backstage segment with the, with the New Day. Um, but, yeah, so I'm going to have to go with Sasha on this one just because, like you said, new, new, new shiny toy syndrome. Um, but here we go. We got that annoying 50-50 booking again. I see your point, and I, this is one I also wouldn't put money on. I mean, any of these matches could go any way because if there's no titles on the line, there's really no weight to this. This, to me, and I, I've said this just as you said, that – this whole pay-per-view is to set up programs within their own brands. Like, there's going to be a, probably a lot of interference in a lot of these matches with their own brands. Because if you lose, you can't go back to SmackDown, theoretically, or Raw, theoretically, to try to get revenge. Because, you, I mean, you're on a different brand. So... That's exactly what I think is going to happen here. If Charlotte returns to screw Asuka and gets right into the women's title picture, very possible. Very possible. It's a babyface versus babyface. So if there's probably going to be an interference in this. No matter who wins, it's going to be a tainted victory because they're both babyfaces. I know that's not how you normally want to have a babyface win, but it's going to have to be inevitable that one of them is going to have to take a tainted loss and one of them is going to have to take a tainted win. So... It's either Carmella comes out to screw Sasha again, or like you said, someone like Charlotte, who apparently is getting very close to returning. And I guess rumors are it's not till the Rumble, which I, I don't buy it. I think it might be earlier. Could Charlotte come back and screw Oscar? Yes. So I think there's I think there's a lot of screwiness in this match. Whoever wins, it's going to be tainted, and we move on because it doesn't matter anyway. It's just to set up a program within that own woman's uh, own woman's brand. I think that's exactly what it is. So I'm sticking with Oscar, but you're right. Charlotte could easily show up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
be, before we get on to uh, Drew McIntyre and um, Roman Reigns, you, you forgot the dual brand Battle Royale on the kickoff show. That was actually at the bottom here. I did not forget. I don't have participants' names. I do, it, unless I missed it, I don't. I don't believe they've announced who's going to be in this dual brand battle royal. I don't know. Do you know? Have any idea who's going to be in this? I again, I've never seen or I haven't seen anything online about it. But my pick, my wild card pick, is going to be this is just uh, an Andre the Andre the Giant battle royale kind of thing, and, and Lars Sullivan is just going to, you know, uh, eliminate every person. The, it's just going to be a, a Lars Sullivan pre-show. I like it. Yes. Yes. I, I, I'm not going to dispute you. I mean, not, number one, I don't have the brain power or capacity right now to uh, to think about a battle royal that never matters anyway, much less on a Survivor Series pay-per-view, of which it means less. So, But yes, we have Lars Sullivan, who we haven't seen in a while. He's just been, I don't know if he's uh, I don't know, too busy on Instagram messaging married women. I don't know. Uh, yeah. maybe, maybe that's what it is. But uh, Lars Sullivan probably wins. Yeah. I mean, sure. That's fine. Lars Sullivan has been kind of MIA, but uh, good candidate. I mean, I have no, I have no rebuttal to that. Like, sure. Um, okay. Well, then, if that's uh, if, if that's it, then I we're in the main event here. Drew McIntyre versus Roman Reigns. I'm going to let you. I'm, I'm going to bounce the ball to you. Do you want to take this one first? Yeah. Um. I, we talked a little bit about it before, and um. And I think I'm I'm with the majority on this one that I think Roman Reigns is going to take this one. Uh, like you said, I think Drew McIntyre can probably take the loss, um, or it will hurt Drew McIntyre less to take the loss. But I, I don't think it's going to be a clean victory. I don't remember the last time Roman Reigns had a clean victory. Um, I think you're probably going to see like one of those low blow kickouts, or um, I don't I don't think we get another person interfering. I don't think I mean the only thing I can think of is Drew McIntyre. The only way Drew McIntyre is going to win this match. Is if um, if Jay Uso comes out, you know, trying to help, interferes, tries to help, and uh, either causes a disqualification, which I really hope I, I want to finish this match. Whether it's Hook or Crook, I want, you know, a pin or a tap out. But um, maybe Jay Uso comes in and uh, and either causes a disqualification or um, or you know tries to help Roman somehow gets in the way. Again, I don't have the brain power right now to to. Uh, to to give you the whole situation, but, um, and somehow, you know, Roman Reigns either, I mean, Drew McIntyre either ends up, you know, hitting the Claymore and getting the one, two, three, or, you know, the most deadly finisher in WWE, the small package. <laughs> I'm telling you, they should just make that the finish. I mean, you, you, you've heard me talk about it. I mean, it's, there will be somewhere in this card, a roll up finish. You can bank on it. Uh, no pun intended, but yeah. Um, Look, this is a match that I am, if you've heard me and my listeners have heard, uh, it's not all about me, but I think the general feeling about for fans, which I'm trying to be a voice for not just myself, but for fans, is that this is a matchup that people want to see, but why are we seeing it right now? Right? Like, I, I am willing and I'm wanting to wait to see this match because it's a match that I have really thought about and like, oh, these two were kind of on parallel paths. They're going to just have an absolute, absolute explosion when they meet. And they put them on a pay-per-view that means nothing in a match that's just exhibition. They could not have executed this worse in terms of having a meaningful first match. And yes, I know they had a WrestleMania match but uh, a couple of years ago, but that was really something that was not in the same stratosphere. Like, they're two different people now. Drew and Roman Reigns have gone through transformations uh, from where they were at that point. But uh, it's happening, so we're in this exhibition match. I'm not happy about it. I I'm happy... Like, I want to see this match. It's weird because I want to see it, just not right now. And I, I'm just more patient, I guess, than maybe some. And so it's happening. I have, I've just kind of accepted it. And that means that, is there a screwy finish to this? I'm looking at all of these thinking there could be screwy finishes. And meaning, does someone interfere? Does someone, like you said, Jey Uso, does he cause a disqualification? Does Randy Orton, God forbid, come out and hit an RKO on both men and leave them laying and, you know, maybe... Roman Reigns comes up first, hits a spear, and wins. Uh, I, I really don't want to see Drew and Orton again. I'm done with that for a while. I think most people are, and I think that's the way they kind of presented it on on Raw this past Monday, that this was it for a while. Does Sheamus come down and screw Drew McIntyre for a Roman Reigns win? I think that is probably the most likely, uh, is we have Drew McIntyre lose 
and I know Sheamus has been kind of friendly backstage, but I think he's been a little too friendly with a heel and babyface being friends. Uh, the question is, does this happen at Survivor Series out of nowhere where he hits a bro kick on Drew with a referee distracted and Roman Reigns wins? Or does he inadvertently cost Drew the match? Or is Sheamus not involved at all? But uh, I think Roman Reigns wins ultimately, yes. It's just a matter of how. And I don't think it's going to be a clean victory over Drew McIntyre. Uh, somebody will be pinned. I just don't think it's going to be a clean victory for Roman. Um, I don't think that Roman should lose right now. I am the, I'm of the belief that he should not lose for many months. Uh, I love heat building for heels. I am a big fan of building heat for heels, and Roman's got something special right now being a heel. And to have him lose to Drew McIntyre would blow off some of that heat for no good reason. They're not on the same brand. It's not WrestleMania. There's no reason to do this right now. So, yeah, uh, Roman wins, but somebody is going to screw Drew McIntyre. I'll just say that. Yeah, I, I completely forgot about Sheamus. Yeah, you know, I couldn't agree more. I, like I said, I, I, I hope, I hope, like you said, it's a, it's a pin or a submission. I don't think either one of these men are going to tap out, but I, I hope it's a pin fall and not, and we're not going to get the main event ending in this qualification. It's just been so much. So much, again, just 50-50 booking. Nobody can beat someone else. You know, we all have to be on the same level playing field. I just, even if it's got to be by hook or crook, I, I hope we get a one, two, three. I think we will. I, I mean, I think, especially if it's the main event, I, I think fans would, if, I mean, so you'd have Twitter blow up. Like, people would not be happy given that. I know there's a lot of people out there who want to see this match, myself included, and you have it end in a DQ. I mean, there's times to do DQ. I have nothing against DQ. It's there for a reason. The finish exists for a reason, but not in this particular instance. Uh, so I'm, I'm totally with you. So, well, uh, Mimi, it has been a real absolute pleasure having you on the show. I'm sure our listeners are looking forward to your, your solo show that you'll be doing starting uh, in about a week with your highs and lows of the week. And uh, that'll be right here on the WWE podcast. So I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, did you have anything else that you wanted to touch on before we wrap things up? Yeah, I got. I have one last quick question for you to get your thoughts on, and um, sure. And then I'll let you go. Uh, you know, Survivor Series, like we said, there's a lot of. It's, it's all about brand versus brand, so not a lot of you know internal brand stuff going on. Um, I've, I know we got Daniel Bryan, Jey Uso, Roman Reigns. There's a couple things here and there, but I think you know, kind of a perfect time to have some some call ups. Uh, from NXT and, and start some new, uh, get some new faces, start some new uh, uh, matchups on on both Raw and SmackDown. I know you're not a you're not a avid watcher of NXT, from what I understand, but I'm wondering if you have any idea or if you could have anybody come up from uh, from NXT to the main roster uh, after Survivor Series. Does anybody come to mind? <laughs> Men and women. Yeah, I mean, just because I don't watch NXT, I mean, I. I understand generally what's happening, right? So you're, you're absolutely right. Like, I don't religiously watch it because I just don't have time. But uh, if I was going to bring somebody up and they would kind of debut somebody, it's kind of an important time of year. I mean, we're ending the year and bam, it's Rumble season and we're into the WrestleMania. Um, unbelievably, we're only like a month and a half away from um, the WrestleMania season. It's, it's crazy. Uh, but Adam Cole, I'd love to see him up. On the main roster, I know Finn Balor's the NXT champion right now, but I think he's fitting in nicely. Adam Cole had a nice showing last year when they actually included NXT into the Survivor Series game. Mm -hmm. And I would bring Adam Cole. I mean, if I was going to just pick one, Adam Cole would probably be my pick. Yeah, yeah, and they're, I know they're having their War Games thing, too, in the Undisputed Era just made their return. It's funny, I, I was thinking um, Rhea Ripley. Mm. Sounds like, you know, after uh, Io Shirai, you know, and, and I think that kind of Charlotte Flair NXT experiment was kind of a failure. I mean, it did it did its job, but um, I'd love to see uh, Rhea Ripley bring some um, some new matchups on, on the main roster. Or Amber Moon. I think Moon. she's almost kind of... Yeah, I, I mean, NXT. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, the, I feel like, you, you know what, when you bring that up, it's it feels as if the women's roster has, it's kind of, it feels really thin right now. I don't know why. I mean, it just feels as if they're just kind of recycling the same women uh, in and out. And I just, I don't know, it feels like it needs a little bit of a refresh. So if they are going to bring somebody up besides the male component, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't mind a couple of the NXT women coming up. I really wouldn't mind it, like you said. 
I mean, uh, it, it feels like they need something new happening besides, again, Natalia and Tamina. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it does. It kind of feels like chewing the same piece of gum for a while. And it's like, okay, I'm ready to move on. So, uh, yeah, no, that, that's, that's an interesting question. One that I don't think many people are considering is the NXT factor. That is really a non-factor this year, which uh, is, is very interesting. You know, to say the least, that they included them last year, and this year NXT is just they don't exist. So, yeah, I was disappointed by that, but I, I am I'm sure it has something to do with the the global pandemic. But I would love, like you said, I think that the women's roster seems very thin. I think you know you had your four women: Charlotte, Becky, and Sasha and Bailey, and now Becky's gone, Charlotte's gone, Sasha and Bailey are done with their rivalry, and and you didn't really, you know, creative didn't uh, take any time to build any other credible, you know, women's wrestlers here. So so we're kind of left, like you said, thin. So, oh, yeah, yeah, I would love to see I mean, Tony Storm, any of these. Yes, any Tony these Storm. Oh, I love Tony Storm in the ring. She's amazing. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, I guess they're too busy doing karaoke segments with, uh, was it Jimmy or Jey Uso over the summer with the women? I mean, that was just, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'm with you. Let's let's kind of shake things up here. And, uh, you know, I know Charlotte, even when she comes back, the, the thing with Charlotte, and I guess I'll close on this because I could go on forever, is that with Charlotte coming back, look, she's a huge star. She's probably one of the biggest women stars WWE has ever had. No question. Future Hall of Famer. Yes, yes, yes. But with Charlotte, I feel like she gets she gets worn out on my TV screen real quick. Like, because they take her and they just, they put her on so many different segments. She becomes champion wherever she is almost instantly. Uh, it just feels like when they get her back, they just, they pound her down our throats and that's what I'm fearful of when they bring her back. Because I remember when she left, I'm like, Oh, thank God. Because she was on every single show. I mean, it felt like she was on NXT. She was on raw. She was on SmackDown and it's kind of like, okay, I need a break from Charlotte. So her injury actually came at a pretty opportune time. Yeah. I couldn't agree more, but don't, don't worry, Matt. I mean, there's a brand split now, so you will only see Charlotte Flair on one show. Well, thank God for that. I mean, and the best part about it is WWE actually, I mean, they adhere to everything that they do. And they explain, I mean, it's really, you know, thank goodness that they are just, well, uh, yeah, they enforce the rules to a T. So there is that. Well, thank God. Um, so, all right. Well, I think this will wrap it up. I mean, we're, we're crazy going on two hours of talking wrestling. That's what happens when wrestling fans get together. So, uh, again, it's, as I said earlier, it's been a pleasure. I'm really glad to have you as part of the team here and uh, be able to talk to you and introduce all of our listeners to you. Again, you will be doing your uh, weekly show starting this week with your ups and downs. And look, I'm looking forward to that personally. I'm sure listeners are as well. Um, did you have any shout outs, any social media you want to share, anything like that or uh, or no? Yeah, I'm I'm boring. I'm like I'm probably the most boring 20 year old out there. I'm, I'm terrible on social media. I, I don't have Twitter. You know, my Facebook's there so people know I'm alive. Instagram is not in- interesting. So, I mean, if, there, if you want to reach me, you're, you're probably going to go through Matt and, and the email. Um but yes, I'll be on um, next week to talk about this week's highs and lows. We're just gonna, you know, talk about, like I said before, you know, what what what's done well, what's not done well, which is hard to watch, and um, and uh, like I think I said, how 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 maybe it could have been better if it can be saved, all that stuff. Just divulge into WWE's good work and and some of the awful stuff they're doing right now. And they always give you some of that to talk about. There's never, (laughs) never, yeah, you always have the extremes. I mean, that's, that's what I think is going to be great about this show is that there's never a week that goes by that you're like, Oh my God, that was terrible. Or that was just awesome. I mean, they seem to give you the extremes, So that's great. Um, but, uh, all right. Well, if you are that boring, then send us our, send the message <laughs> through me guys. I mean, like, uh, so uh, trust me, we'll make it not boring. Send me the questions at real WWE podcast at gmail.com. But, uh, Mimi, thank you so much for coming on. I know it's late. I appreciate you taking the time, certainly on a, uh, on a Saturday night, nonetheless, before a pay-per-view. So, uh, I, I'm looking forward to this and, uh, and looking forward to your show and you'll have to have you back on. Of course. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much.